O light of the ineffable word, light of the word from out of the heart of Brahma, we gather to celebrate in this hour the communion of our twin flames. Out of the white fire core of being, out of the magnificent ovoid of light, descend, O living word, beloved Alpha and Omega, Thou who art the beginning and the ending of our secret love star, anchor now upon this force field at this altar, the twin flames of light that hold the electronic pattern of our divine destiny as one. Out of the cosmic Christ come forth living light of the Father, Mother, God, I call to the Elohim and Archangels of Heaven to cut free our twin souls for a fiery destiny, for a cosmic purpose, for the balancing of our karma and our service to light, that we might return to the very heart of Thee, God victorious. I call to the hosts of the Lord to contact now these heart flames, by the magnitude of God's love, by the cosmic polarity, let the light descend for the confirmation of our union. Wherever the twin flame may appear, so let the hearts, the threefold light, unite, and let the victory of God be our oneness. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to greet you in the light of the rainbow rays of your twin flame. Won't you be seated? We have called this seminar because the karmic board has announced in the recent decade that they are sending forth the light and the dispensation for twin flames to work together in the task which is set before us, which is to bring enlightenment to this world to help all people realize their inner potential and thus hand in hand in a mutual service to strike that blow for the Lord that enables both halves of the divine whole to return to the one. The study of twin flames is often a fad. It comes about when people are seeking a mate in life and sometimes the pursuit is by psychic or human means. And all that people think about twin flames is the most fantastic love affair that anyone could ever think of. <laughs> Something so far beyond this world as to really be unrealistic. This is not what this seminar is about. We all have to come to grips with the fact that our twin flame may not be eligible in this moment. Our twin flame may be 20 or 30 years younger than we are, or older than we are, or not in embodiment at all, or in the higher octaves of service, or perhaps even on another planetary body. The point of the pursuit of the twin flame is the recognition that at the very center of the I am presence, which you see illustrated behind me, is a white fire core. And the design of that fiery core is in the balance of cosmos, the alpha, the omega. For the purposes of incarnation, out of the white fire core, there is a separation of that fiery body. And so the one become two, 
and the two become the identical pattern of the chart that is behind me, which shows the I am presence, the descending Christ self, and then you evolving on earth as that person standing in the violet flame. So twin flames, by definition, are two individuals holding the masculine and feminine polarity of God, sometimes alternately in succeeding incarnations. Two individuals who hold the identical electronic blueprint in life. That electronic blueprint comes from that white fire body. It is then the matrix of each one's own I am presence, each one's individual Christ self. Each one is a full and whole and complete person and intended again to become the androgynous whole, but forevermore in service, in holding the balance of life, in holding the flame of God as father and as mother, that counterpart is the one, is irreplaceable, and wherever that counterpart is, anywhere in cosmos, there is the link, there is the tie, and every thought and feeling, everything we do, affects the other half of the divine whole. The soul that comes forth out of that fire body as the potential to realize God in this octave is the negative polarity of that spiritual being, that divine being of inner levels. These twin souls then reflect their inner spiritual origin and identity. As you will hear or have already heard on our Twin Flames in Love album, the souls who go forth karma free the first time they put their feet on planet Earth before making any karma have no reason to be separated. They live and move and breathe as one. Adam and Eve are archetypical twin flames. There are many in the Bible, in history, and their life patterns, their historical natures reveal the ups and downs, the upheavals of twin flames, and all sorts of very difficult circumstances which are brought, upon, brought about solely by karma and which cause the separation of those twin souls. This separation is very painful because it is separation from oneself. Even though one has the absolute and totality of God as one's being, one senses that a part of oneself, especially at the soul level, is incomplete. This is because when we are in embodiment, we, car we carry either the plus or the minus polarity. We come into manifestation stamped with the gender of male or female. Whereas at inner levels, we experience the divine wholeness within that mighty I am presence. At outer levels, we look for the help meet. And therefore, the long trek and journey, the pilgrimage of the millennia, for this involves tens of thousands of years of the journey, is the quest the quest is the seeking and the finding of one's own I am presence, one's Christ self, and the path of one's personal discipleship to return to the white fire core of being, which is the point of origin. The second quest is the quest for the one and the only one who lawfully can abide in that same white fire core of being. Sometimes we may happily, by karma, both positive and negative, find the twin flame before we find our own godhood and the understanding of our potential for being. Sometimes we may search a lifetime or many lifetimes and have difficulty finding God as well as the twin flame. But there is a flame that burns with a never-ending, never-dying fervor within your heart and my heart. It is the flame of love. God is that love. And it is our love for our Creator 
and our love for the one whom our Creator made us to be a part of. Now I can tell you from my personal experience in this life, having met and found my twin flame in the person of Mark Prophet, whose portrait hangs and whom you may look upon at this moment, My understanding of the quest for the twin flame and the finding of the twin flame is very vivid and I would like to tell it to you because often we learn things about the personal experience of someone else. First of all, I never knew that there was any such thing as a twin flame until I was about 18 or 19 and I read Unveiled Mysteries, the I Am Discourses and the Magic Presence, which were written and published by Godfrey and Lotus Ray King. And in these books there is the description of the twin flames coming forth from God. The description is not as full as that I've given to you, but it is very clear that we each have a divine counterpart. My quest, however, in those early years of searching, which really began when I was very tiny, was to find God and to discover what His mission was for me. In my mind, I was very determined to get to the very foundation of my life and to do what I knew I had to do, what was an impelling call from within. Now, in retrospect, as I have looked back upon this life and read the record of my own life stream in these years, I have seen that in those years of searching for God, I used to leave my body in sleep at night and go to the inner temples and work with the ascended masters and work with my twin flame who was Mark Prophet who was about 20 years my senior according to the calculations of this life and therefore pioneered before me and performed the work of the twin flame to lay the foundation of the work which I was also to accomplish we find that we do this for one another and as far as twin flames are concerned, the age of the body has nothing to do with the age of the soul because one's souls are the same age, having begun together in the beginning in the white fire core. I realize that this decision of our life streams and of the karmic board to have this age difference enabled us to get, you might say, the most for our money. He had 20 years of service to the Brotherhood before I was even ready to take on that service. And so we met when I was 22. I was looking for the teacher and the guru because I knew there was that one who was going to give to me the key to my mission. What I did not know was that my inner understanding included the fact that it was the twin flame who was my teacher. And therefore, without knowing it, in seeking the teacher, I was also seeking and coming closer and closer, closer and closer to the outer experience of service that was already going on at inner levels. So when I saw Mark Prophet for the first time, I recognized him as teacher. He, seeing me for the first time, recognized me as twin flame. It was a very interesting experience because I was so one-pointed in that direction that I was almost burdened by the thought that I had to deal with other types of relationships or other types of manifestations. And of course, I wanted to be absolutely certain and I wanted to have the confirmation in my own being that every step that I took was right and was the will of God so that I would not make any mistake to the harm of any part of life. By this time in my service, I had seen El Moria, who had appeared to me in the park in Boston, to let me know that indeed I should become a messenger and I should be trained. I was aware of the Ascended Masters. I felt very close to El Moria. As I came to find out later, I have known him as many of us have in previous embodiments. And so I made a call to El Moria and I asked him to reveal to me and confirm within my own being 
that this indeed was my twin flame and that the mission was far more vast and far more complete than I could have ever have contemplated in the mere search for the living teacher. And I remember a very astounding experience that I had. It was one of these indelible experiences that one can never erase, it never dims by time, and one has the sense almost of the impact that you would imagine if you met an extraterrestrial visitor or something of the absolute extraordinary occurred. And it was this. This is the way El Moria confirmed to me the presence of my twin flame. I went to look in the mirror. I wasn't actually going to a mirror to look into it. It happened to be where I was dressing. And I looked up and I looked in the mirror and I did not see myself, I saw the face of the soul of Mark Prophet. Now if you can ever imagine looking in a mirror and not seeing yourself, <laughs> it's a very shocking experience. <laughs> and what I saw was really the revelation of the inner soul pattern, not just of the soul which is that potential to become God, but I saw the pattern of the white fire body. Not only did I see his face, but I saw that I was the reflection in the negative polarity of that positive image that I was viewing. And so through my whole body was the confirmation of the inner pattern. Now the thing you have to realize is that this knowing has nothing to do with being in love in the human sense of the word. And for as long as I have been teaching the last 21 years since this experience occurred to me in 1961, I have received probably hundreds and hundreds of letters from people concerning twin flames. And they will tell me that they have found their twin flame on the basis of a human love experience or that their astrology is in polarity, or all sorts of verifications that they look for in the outer sense. You must remember that Jesus said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. We are not twin flames by virtue of our flesh and blood condition. I have seen twin flames where the man was 20 and the woman was 70. Now I don't consider that it is in my place to reveal twin flames to one another. God shows me many things about life streams and he has explained to me after I have been burdened by the situation that if people do not recognize one another then they are not ready to recognize one another and I should leave well, well enough alone and allow them to evolve to their own mighty I am presence until God in them chooses to reveal that relationship. If the relationship is not going to serve a divine purpose, a spiritual purpose, if a relationship involves breaking up families and homes and causing a cataclysm in people's lives because they are in different situations that they are bound to be involved with during past karma, then the outer mind would rather not have to deal with what the soul knows at the subconscious level. The outer mind can only handle so many circumstances, so much karma at a given time. And so we have to understand that the encounter with people, the intense encounter of the feeling of a polarity which may very well be spiritual, of a mutual love that is intense, can be the result of many different circumstances. Karmic relationships are always intense. We have many such relationships with people with whom we have made karma in the past, good karma and bad karma. 
Sometimes the worse the karma, the more intense the impact when we first meet someone. Because there is God imprisoned in past negative activity, a negative experience of the past, such as violence, hatred, murder, um, non-caring for one's children, one's family, something that you have done together with someone else that has really caused an imbalance in your soul, in your life stream, a weight, an absence of resolution. This is a very gnawing condition in consciousness. Your soul knows why you have come into embodiment. You have stood before the karmic board. You have been told there is this situation that requires resolution. You and this person once caused the collapse of this city or many people to be involved in, uh, in famine. Uh, these are not unlikely situations. The ramifications of what we do by committing sin or b by omitting to serve life are very great and they're very heavy. The soul at inner levels is very conscientious and desiring to serve, to do what's right, and to right things that are wrong. So you may meet someone, and especially this may occur in the teenage years, latter teenage years, 20s, and the impact will be stunning. It's like the impact of planetary bodies. And it will be stunning because you are so excited that you have found the person with whom you can balance this section of karma and your soul knows that if you do not get through that karma, you cannot enter world service. There may be children involved and you may have to have certain numbers of children who are a part of a, a certain family or group karma. And because the goal of life is reunion with the Christ Self, reunion with your I Am Presence, and ultimately reunion with your twin flame, you realize that if you don't get this karma balanced, you will not get to your twin flame. And so the faster you submit to the law of your own karma, the faster you are going to be liberated. Now, here in the dawn of the age of Aquarius, we are in a situation where all things are coming home to roost. All of the birds that we've sent forth from our mental body, the fishes out of the emotional body, all things are swimming and flying back to roost in our tree of life and in the flowing stream of that tree of life because it is the age of conclusion, it is the age of resolution. And so you may have one of these very intense impacts in a relationship you may be, dis you may be in, in the sphere of that karma, in the level of awareness which you can have, which is inclusive of your consciousness, of your karma. There is nothing more important. There's no one in all the world you'd rather be with. There's nothing you'd rather do. The love is there. The newness of the relationship is there. You marry, you start a family, you start working together, and you start working out this karma. Well, you all know the expression, the honeymoon is over. <laughs> well, that expression has to do with the impact of karma once there is a binding relationship of marriage. And this is why people do not like to get married because they resist bearing one another's burden. And that is the inner meaning of the ritual of marriage. In marriage, we come together till death do us part in sickness, in health, for richer or for poorer, and so forth. And that means that when we are wed, our karma is one. We share our karma, good and bad. That's why Jesus said we should not be unequally yoked together with those of unlike mind. And what, what fellowship hath light and darkness? If you marry someone who is beneath you in the momentum of light attainment, who has a very heavy karma, when the honeymoon is over, you're going to feel the weight and the impact that you have taken on the karma of someone else. And that someone else is on the good end of the bargain because he's gotten all the light you have or she has and so forth. But nevertheless, that still may be ordained and it may, may be the correct decision. And it must be the correct decision because you made it. And you made it the decision because you needed to make the decision because your soul had a need to resolve. This need for resolution can be explained by 
the way an oyster feels when he gets a little grain of sand and he's got to keep on covering it over and covering it over because it's a botheration. It's an irritant to his world. Because it's an irritant, he makes a pearl out of it. He doesn't value the pearl, but we do. So we go and harvest the pearl. Well, that's how karma is. It irritates. And we want to smooth it over. We want to make it right. And the way to smooth things over is to experience love in a day-to-day -day situation. Now, the thing about this karmic marriage that you are into is that you can never get out of it, you can never get free of the relationship if you don't meet every jot and tittle of the law, if you don't balance ultimately and finally what there is between you, you will re-embody and you will still have to enter into some sort of a relationship with that person even if it is a business partnership or whatever it may be. So we realize that life in the context of discipleship of the goal of reunion with God is something more than the fantasy of the divine romance. The divine romance is there, it's waiting for you, and what you have to realize is you are already experiencing that divine romance at inner levels of your being. No one, no one in heaven or in earth can separate you from your twin flame. That's why it is said whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. That is a quote from the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you go to the altar of a church and a minister or rabbi or priest pronounces the blessing upon the marriage, he is doing so at your behest because you have requested that you should be married. You are receiving a blessing, but it is not a condition or an estate where it can be said, whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. God has joined together you and your twin flame in the beginning. And in all other conditions and circumstances of life, no one can separate you from that love of God in your twin flame. That is the real meaning of that passage of Scripture. So karmic marriages, marriages of soulmates, which we are also going to discuss. Other conditions of life may come and go, and they are for a purpose. And while we are in the midst of them, they are intended to be a celebration on earth, a divine ritual on earth of our inner union with our twin flame. And this is lawful. What is not lawful is that you treat such a relationship lightly and do not give it your best and your most and the most fervent love of your heart because you say, well, this person is not my twin flame and uh, this is just a karmic situation, so I'll, I'll give it a, a token effort, but uh, you know, I'm going to wait till the real thing comes along. Well, that's a very good way to prolong your karma and to make more karma. We look at life in terms of the fact that People whom we are with, no matter who they are, no matter what relationship, of all the human relationships we have, whoever we are dealing with is God. The person is God, the divine flame is God, the potential is God, and we must love that person with our whole heart, with the purest and highest love that we would have for God and for our twin flame. That love is liberating. It is a transmutative force. We need forgiveness in relationships. We all have much to forgive and much to be forgiven for, or we would not find ourselves on this planet at this point in time and space. There's one thing we can all be certain of. We need the grace of God. We need the flame of forgiveness. And we need liberally to forgive others and to forgive ourselves because that's the whole point of karma. So it doesn't matter if you're married to your twin flame, if you've ever met your twin flame. What matters is that you realize the sacredness of marriage and the relationship of man and woman and that this polarity is always representative of Alpha and Omega. And when each individual, whether they are twin flames or not, goes into the very depths of that I am presence, that superconscious self, 
and puts on that fire and that presence and that love and can hold the balance of either Alpha or Omega as a divine office, as a divine purpose, and can keep the focus of that purpose on a daily basis. He is therefore supplying the counterpart to the person that might be husband or wife. And he is also holding a magnet of purest intensity for that twin flame who may be on the other side of the cosmos, who may be an ascended master, or who may be a child of 13 that is going through the first testings and temptations of taking drugs, alcohol, and so forth. Wherever your twin flame is, even if your twin, even if your twin flame is a cosmic being, your twin flame needs your support and your love. Because if you are in a negative vibration, you can actually hinder the activity and service of an ascended master, an angel, someone who is trying to fight for freedom in Poland today, someone in Russia who's standing against the KGB or lying in a hospital, being injected with drugs to become a vegetable. Whoever the person is, if you let down your flame, you are letting down first Almighty God and second your twin flame. And ultimately, you will suffer because a setback to your twin flame is a setback to you. And on that day when you make your ascension and you would like to know your twin flame is going to ascend also, that twin flame may not be ready to ascend, may have another thousand years to embody upon earth because you did not supply that extra thrust of spirituality and light and selflessness that could propel that person into a higher dimension of their own consciousness. So when we say no man is an island, no woman is an island, we truly understand that the twin flame as the other half of the whole is experiencing the ramifications and the repercussions of our life. Now I have a, a very conscious awareness of the fact that I am a support to my twin flame. As I was saying yesterday, the most important thing about being woman is to understand that one is needed. I think that's important to man also. We all need to feel needed. When I first met Mark at the age of 22, and I was called by El Moria to be trained to be a messenger, El Moria and Mark told me that according to his life cycles, he would not be an embodiment more than three years and that if I didn't discipline myself and submit to the discipline, that I would not receive the mantle of messenger and there would not be one carrying that mantle and that authority. So I had a great impetus to beat into submission that beast of the carnal mind, that human ego, and any and all other planes of human consciousness that would be non-acceptable as a vessel for the Ascended Masters. And so I did what I knew how to do, which was to care for Mark in terms of his diet, in terms of his life, in terms of keeping the pressures off of him, and doing all those things that become burdensome in running an organization and doing the work. So he was given the dispensation by his own renewed vigor and determination in life to be with us 12 years rather than three. And so we had the benefit of 12 years of teaching from him rather than three years. Now I'm certain that that was by the grace of God and of course I take no credit for it because anything we do unless God adds his grace is really of no avail. And God chooses to insert his grace into our human efforts when he weighs the heart and weighs the situation and performs his will. I have the sense today, since the ascension of our mark, that I played a role in assisting him in his 12-year cycle to balance those conditions of karma that we needed to balance together. And that togetherness had to do with bringing forth a teaching, contacting many individuals who have ascended through that mission, having our four children, and preparing the entire foundation so that all of you and many more 
could come into this path of doing the very same thing, finding the teachings, finding your I am presence, and beginning that sense of conscious cooperation with your twin flame. Now Mark is ascended, and I realize that my being in embodiment has multifaceted purposes. I am here for one thing, to complete the balance of 100% balance of karma for both of us, so that when we're both ascended, we will be free. I am here to anchor the teachings that he began. He in the masculine polarity occupies the office of Alpha. The office of Alpha is to send forth the Alpha thrust. It is always the initiation and the original impelling of the mission that is to be accomplished by twin flames that comes forth through the masculine half of the whole. And it is the office of the mother or the omega half to bring this to the return, to take that cycle and bring it right back to the point of origin in a complete circle. So we say God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Well, this Elohim, the divine us, male and female, the author of our faith will be our father, and the finisher of our faith will be our mother. And so I understand fully, as you do, that all we have is teaching comes through the divine author, Almighty God, which was set forth to us by our beloved Mark. And the finishing of that faith comes forth through the amplification the breaking of the bread of the teaching, the further details on the original matrix. It's like the Father provides the skeleton, the original spirit impetus, the seed of life, and the mother fills in so that we have a bouncing, beautiful baby boy or baby girl when the, ma when the matrix is complete. So the publishing of the teaching, the, the ongoingness of the breaking of this bread of life so that you can assimilate it and understand it, so that we can hear it again and again until we have all become the fullness of our own Father, Mother, God. So this is my understanding of my usefulness. It's also my understanding of why, when twin flames are concluding their mission, why perhaps one is taken and another is left, which are the words of Jesus two laborers laboring in the field. Well, the two laborers may very well be you and your twin flame. Or they may be you in a karmic situation where one remains with the karma and one goes on to a higher mission because his karma is through. So I understand that there is no separation in God. And I do understand that we also have to live with the law of octaves. And I do understand that it is lawful in the Aquarian age, therefore, for the ritual of marriage to be celebrated for other reasons than the marriage of twin flames. It may be the very reason which Gautama Buddha has taught us that in order for any mission we have to be fulfilled, we must be holding or someone must be holding the alpha and the omega polarity in physical octave. And therefore, having known and had a marriage of twin flames, we might enter in to the experience of the realization that our twin flame is ascended, someone else's twin flame is ascended, and therefore we need to hold the divine cube, where on earth we are holding the balance of alpha and omega, and in heaven that same balance is being held. It's a wondrous thing to contemplate the life of Saint Germain and of Mother Mary. Saint Germain is the hierarch of the Aquarian age, Mother Mary is an archangel, and she is the divine complement of Raphael. They came into embodiment for a very specific purpose, to give birth to the avatar of the Piscean Age, Jesus Christ. Raphael, the archangel, held the balance in heaven for Mary and the twin flame of Saint Germain, who is known as the goddess of justice, held the balance for him during many long incarnations. So, the laws of God take into account and accommodate the human condition. We all have a human condition right now. You have a scroll upon which is written the law of your life, which is the law of your karma, which you have made. As a co-creator with God, you have made good karma, you have made bad karma. The law is written of the inner blueprint which is underneath this page. Our human karma is like an overlay 
which we've put over the original fiery blueprint. We see that overlay, we see its writing, and we see peeking through what is underneath. We all know how life should be for us, how we would like it to be in the idyllic, Edenic sense of the word. And then we look about us and we are still in the state of toiling. But we have hope in our heart, Jesus Christ, Christ the hope of glory in each of us. And that hope lies in the fact that we know what is real at inner levels. We know where we have come from. We know who we are. We know where we are going. God has given to us the gift of the violet flame to get there. And so we take every day as an opportunity to erase the overlay so that one day that entire page can be turned over and once again we are returned to that point of Eden. You see, each of us with our twin flame has our own little Adam and Eve story to tell. One partakes of the fruit of the human consciousness in place of waiting for the initiation of Maitreya. The other partakes of the fruit sometimes solely because the other does not want to be separated from the first and therefore has enough sense to make the identical karma, to receive the identical punishment so that there will not be a separation. This is an amazing experience of twin flames. So great is that love. And so they go forth from the mystery school of the cosmic Christ and the edict is to toil by the sweat of the brow. Now we know that's an allegory in Genesis and we know that there are overlays overlays of different civilizations. We know that most of the sacred scriptures of the world contain a story about man and woman and their fall. This re refers actually to the descent of you and your twin flame from the etheric octave. The place of the pristine purity of the golden age consciousness to the place where we are now burdened by the weight of karma that is upon us. The weight of karma is a weight of energy. It begins to interfere with the untrammeled and free flow of light in the heart and, and the chakras. So we are no longer spinning at such an intense velocity of light. We are literally burdened. Now we know the meaning of the weight of a physical body. We know the meaning of the weight and the gravitational pull of the earth. It's harder to move around. We have to experience cycles of rest. We are limited. We can all only do so much in each given day and then the body is spent and we must put it to rest and recharge it again. We all have that sense of limitation which we did not have in the etheric octaves or in the golden ages. So that descent is the point of sorrow and the greatest sorrow of course is separation from the face-to-face -face encounter with a beloved I Am Presence, the face-to-face -face encounter with the person of Christ, our Christ Self or the Guru, the Avatar, and then the loss of the perpetual communion with the Twin Flame. So at that point we begin to make karma with other life streams and there are the long separations which may go on for many lifetimes. So this is sometimes the source of depression, sorrow, burden, sense of lack of fulfillment in life. And often, of course, it is an illusion because people say, well, if only my twin flame were here, everything would be wonderful. And I can't get along with this person and we're not really alike and we don't agree, we don't think alike and all these problems that come up in relationships. And we have the sense of the ideal the sense of who this person is and this person will absolutely, completely and totally be our complement and uh, all of our dreams and wishes will come true. Well actually, twin flames develop different personalities by being separated for so long. They actually go through uh, conditionings, negative conditionings by negative experiences. Twin flames are not necessarily alike. They may have a, an astrology that clashes. I remember an astrologist once told Mark and me that we should never be married because we couldn't possibly get along with the, the astrology that we had. <laughs> he was a Capricorn and I'm an Aries, which is a combination of an earth and fire sign. They say either the earth will put out the fire or the fire will scorch the earth. 
Additionally, we're both first-rate people and powerful people. Well, I realized in this relationship that there was only one way that the relationship would work, and that was that one of us had to be the boss and one of us had to submit, and I understood completely who, who was who in that relationship. <laughs> And if I didn't understand it, I was very swiftly reminded by Mark. <laughs> so, luckily, I figured that one out and uh, we lived happily ever after. I was very happy to be in the point of Chila to Mark and I realized that he was actually the only person in all of Cosmos that could have brought me to the very quintessence of my own being because he, as no one else, knew my soul because he contained my soul pattern. So he knew me in the beginning. He knew what I should be manifesting and what I was not. He knew exactly what was a deviation from the inner alignment with that blueprint. He knew what was excess human consciousness picked up as baggage in life from all of the many interactions we've had with so many life streams and conditions. And so he was highly qualified to bring me to an abrupt waking awareness of the disparity between the inner divine being that I am and you are and all of us is and sometimes the paltry and shameful manifestation which is shameful not because it's so bad but it's shameful because it's such a a mediocre version of what the inner self really is. And when you have one who is a guru and a master at that, who can plug you back into that original design, you are electrified with the sense within yourself of who you really are and what you should be. And I think this is a, a wonderful part of a twin flame relationship when the twin flame is the Guru Chila relationship. And this often occurs. It occurs in the case of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, as you know. And he had the power, as no one else had the power, to draw her back into the perfect image of the Divine Woman and the Divine Mother. And what's more, he contained the love, the love of his being for her to lay down his life that she might live. And he gave that same love to us as his disciples. And the disciple and the master relationship is also the polarity of Alpha and Omega. This is why in the Catholic Church the nuns are considered the bride of Jesus Christ because he is like their twin flame by proxy because he is the focal point of the cosmic Christ representative of the one who will ultimately become the divine whole. So when you have a guru the guru does hold the focus and the flame in physical embodiment for your twin flame and holds the inner pattern and the Christic pattern for you because the faster you become more like the Christ who you are, the faster you will become the magnet to magnetize the soul of your twin flame back to that same original blueprint. So in terms of twin flames and the meeting of twin flames, we have to go back to the statement of Jesus Christ once again, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven and flesh and blood does not guarantee you a harmonious relationship with anyone including your twin flame. What will guarantee it is your determination to work hard at a relationship. There is no relationship. Any friendship, our children, brothers and sisters, relatives, professional relationships. There's no relationship which, if it's going to endure, does not require work. We all have to give of ourselves and give a lot in order to sustain that interaction with anyone. So you have to see that twin flames, by having gone all over the earth in all kinds of incarnations and circumstances, might, through karmic conditions, have superficial personality clashes. And when these were, are seen as superficial and we get to the heart of the matter, then we're in the driver's seat and then we become co-creators with God. 
So you see, if, if you go through a lot of relationships and you can't hold on to them and you can't really get to the profound inner meaning of these relationships, I don't wish you much success in finding your twin flame because you'll probably experience a failure at that also. You see, twin flames do make karma with each other in various embodiments. We do make karma with each other. And so that karma also has to be balanced when we finally get back together. And so there can be a tremendous sense of injustice between twin flames. You did this terrible thing to me. Now I'm going to get even with you and you can see how it feels. <laughs> so that also explains what occurs in karmic relationships where you see marriages and you see, see people and they, they fight hard and you can see no purpose to the relationship. Why don't they just quit and separate because this has been going on for years and next thing you know they're, they're back by, as lovebirds again and starting all over again and this repeats and repeats and repeats and nobody can understand what's going on except the two people involved. And of course it's a very dangerous thing because there's a lot of karma making in that heavy discord, those heavy scenes. And ultimately they become so self-destructive that uh, often the solution is for people to go their separate ways, even twin flames. I've seen twin flames and I know of twin flames who have destroyed their lives, destroyed their marriages when if they just had an understanding of the law and a commitment to the relationship, they could have made some forward progress. I've seen twin flames were alcoholics, drug addicts. I've seen them ruin their lives, ruin the lives of their children, wind up in the dregs of disappointment, and life comes to a conclusion, and they pass from the screen of life, and they are, they are sorry beyond words at the soul level when they stand before the karmic board and see that they utterly failed in the assignment to go down and, and uh, get things together and make things happen. So you need to be ready to meet your twin flame. You need to have a good deal of self-mastery. You have to have a dedication to something more than your twin flame and that something more is God. You've got to love God first and be very sure of your path and your service and that you're not going to give in to discord or the theatrics of the human ego and all kinds of self-indulgence and demands. You cannot demand that anyone be a complement to your human personality with all of its faults. You cannot expect someone to be to you father and mother and brother and sister and lover and husband and son and daughter all at once so that every time you experience the least little bit of a problem, your idea is that this twin flame or this spouse is going to move right in and pick you up and everything's going to be rosy. You have to decide to be complete in yourself and then by the magnet of your wholeness, you will attract wholeness in another person. Now I have to tell you that sometimes and in some circumstances, because, such a, because of such a difference between twin flames. God actually works it so that we embody as brother and sister, or as twin flames, or as father and, and child, or of the same sex. Because on a marriage relationship, the relationship would not be profitable and would probably hinder those persons more than help them because a marriage would, would produce more bad karma because neither one has the mastery or the commitment to sub subdue the discord and only allow harmony to flow. There is nothing more painful to a cosmos than arguments between twin flames. It violates the Father, Mother, God in heaven and in earth. It's a desecration against the Holy Spirit. The twin flames of the Holy Spirit, which are called cloven tongues in the Bible, are the twin flames of you and your counterpart. And if you ever remember being a child and hearing an argument between your father and mother, no worse experience could you have. It's a crushing, it's a crushing blow to life that those who hold the office of father and mother should experience any discord in the flow of that divine love. And so it is painful to the souls of twin flames. At inner levels, twin flames do not want 
this to occur because they know how damaging it is because it will keep them separated for succeeding incarnations. And so we have to give. We all have human weaknesses. We all have human problems. We have human things we haven't overcome. And when we think of the spouse, the divine spouse, the perfect one for us, we always imagine that that person should be perfect. So when they're not perfect in our eyes, which is only by our own state of imperfection that we have the image in the first place, we throw a tantrum, we rant, we rave, we make demands, we scream, we sob. All these things that are going on in marriages all over the world. Because somebody is expecting another person to be something more than that person is and something more than they are. If we have faults, we want the other person to be perfect. So we make demands of people in a marriage that are totally unrealistic. And this is why marriages fall apart. Not to mention, of course, that one of the basic reasons people marry is for a sensual gratification. Putting that aside, all of the other psychological situations of personality become a horrendous mark against the divine image of Father, Mother, God, against wholeness. So I advocate that one meditate upon oneself, one's life, and realize that if you want to attract the Lady of Grace or the Knight in Shining Armor, you have to become that counterpart first. And you ought to look at yourself in terms of scrubbing up that karma with violet flame and meditation, coming to a resolution of your own psychology. And the only real desire that you ought to have in seeking your twin flame is to bring that twin flame the gift of your own spiritual attainment as well as your outer professional accomplishments. You should seek Jesus Christ or Saint Germain for the same reason not for what they can do for you, but what you, because of self-effort, can bring to add to their identity. What bouquet of flowers are you ready today to bring to your twin flame? I'd like you to meditate upon this because it's a most important part of your understanding of your psychology, after you have defined what you are capable of giving, on one piece of paper you should write down in your notebooks what you know in the past by past performance and present awareness you're not capable of giving. And decide if it's a good idea that you get some capacity in that area. You might say, well, one thing I can't do, I don't know how to cook. So I can't cook a meal for this twin flame. Well, whether you're a man or a woman, you like to have somebody cook a meal for you once in a while. You ought to learn to cook. Get down to the basics in life. Can you keep a schedule? Can you add to a household? Can you be patient with children? Can you be patient with the child in the person that you're imagining is going to come down the highway one of these days? Look at how you interact with yourself. Can you get along with yourself? Or do you have problems in yourself? Do you have moods? Do you have ups and downs? Now, when you look at the balance of the flowers you can offer and the weeds you haven't yet plucked from your garden or the empty earth, the barren earth where you haven't planted a flower, then you turn around and you get on the receiving end. Now you pretend you're the other person. And you pretend you're the other person seeing you coming down the road. Are they going to be interested or not interested? <laughs> Does the person that's so wonderful that you're imagining, are they going to want you? If they're so wonderful, they may be so wonderful, they may be too wonderful. <laughs> they may not even notice you. In other words, you've got to become very wonderful yourself, as wonderful as the person that you desire to be with. And you have to be that in fact and in reality and not in fantasy. You've got to be able to deliver the goods. So now you're the other person coming down the road, and he or she is coming down the road, and maybe it is your twin flame and they see you, and you're standing here, 
and they walk on by. You say, wait a minute, you're supposed to stop when you get to me. <laughs> but they didn't stop when they got to you because they didn't find in you a magnet. You did not have the capacity to magnetize the person that you imagine is your divine polarity. Well, why didn't you have the capacity? You have to imagine what that person would be looking for. You know what you want in that person. You know the virtues and qualities. If you don't contain them, if you don't contain the same virtues and qualities you're looking for, the person will not recognize you. It's like ships passing in the night. Now, many people think it's all in the package, it's all in the appearance, but it isn't. That wears away very quickly. You've got to have heart, you've got to have soul, you've got to be willing to give, and you've also got to be willing to demonstrate that you do have the qualifications for the job. And what's the job? It's an office. It's saying, here's the person who is the alpha, here's the person who's the omega. I want to be the counterpart to that person. I have to be able to prove to that person that I can hold the balance for their mission. I can uphold them, I can serve with them, I can provide the counterpart of qualities they need. Maybe the person is the owner of a gas station or a restaurant. Maybe the person is a nurse or a doctor. Whatever they do, you've got to be able to give something to their life that they need because all relationships are based on need. We don't form partnerships or marriages or associations or even friendships except the fact that we perceive another's need and we're happy to give it. We have needs and they're happy to give it. When you stop having needs, you generally stop calling people up and seeing them. Even if it's a need to play a game of cards with somebody or go to the horse races or do anything that people do in the world. If you can share something, you've got similar qualities. Now, you may share things at one level, but when it comes to a spiritual sharing, there may be a blank. And you have to learn to live with the idea that if you're going to establish your life with someone and there's a gaping hole of an area that means a lot to you and you know it's not going to work, you have to be honest. You have to be very honest in a relationship because you may see well in advance that you're not going to be able to provide interest a major interest that that person needs and you may see they're not going to be able to provide yours and if you're the one that can see it then you will bear the karma of going into that relationship because your human wants it even though your heart and your mind and your soul really know that it's not going to work the reason that this is such a, a, a situation of concern to us all is that each of us really does have a fundamental need to relate to at least one person in life in a very personal way because the Alpha Omega relationship always needs to be filled in. We have to recognize that circumstance and karma may demand that the person that we're going to be close to in life may not be a spouse. It may be a co-worker on the path. It may be the guru. It may be the master. It may be a child. Or we may be able to translate it to an entire group of people who now become for us the fulfillment of our life and the inner meaning of our souls. So when we recognize the fundamental soul need for the friend in life, we need to be careful to realize that we really do need a friend, but a friend that does not meet that need, a friend that is lower in vibration than what our souls require, becomes no friend at all. In fact, becomes a shackle and a burden and a drag. And when we have that kind of relationship with people, we realize we're wasting our life and we're wasting our time, we're wasting their time, and we've only got three score and ten and maybe a little bit more and we've got things we've got to do so in the area of twin flames and life in general the process of sublimation is something you always have to be aware is one way of dealing with the absence 
in physical proximity of the friend. Sublimation means taking the energy of the need and the creative force of our life itself and projecting it into the future as a future goal. And in the meantime, while reaching that goal of the perfect love, we love all life. We love people, many people, individually and personally, in a very deep way. We have good relationships, good associates. But we understand that what we are looking for and what we know is there just beyond the veil already does exist. And in the process of our self-mastery, we learn to live with that fact and we say, I will go through the coil of experience, I will go through the cycles necessary to get there. It's like knowing you're going to meet someone in Rome. It takes so many days to travel there, so many planes, so many stopovers. Distances are shortening in the modern age. But a journey is required before one can actually be there. If we don't understand sublimation, or etherealization, if we are a, cre a creature of wants and demands, I want what I want and I want it now and it has to be now, we will accept a lesser standard in our lives and we will actually not have the power to attract to ourselves what really is the fulfillment of the divine meeting as well as the divine plan for this embodiment. In time and space, there are always distances. You may be experiencing hunger right now. You may know the foods in the cafeteria, and it's a question of time and footsteps to get there. You're sublimating that hunger and deciding you'll stay and listen to me a little bit longer. <laughs> well, we're adults, and we've learned to deal with all kinds of things in life in that manner. We're no longer babies in the cradle that can be fed on demand. So it's all right to acknowledge the need. But remember, a need is also an absence of wholeness. And an absence of wholeness makes you incomplete. And when you're incomplete, you are not a divine magnet that can attract to yourself the very thing you need to complete your wholeness. So while you are aware of the fact that you are incomplete, in some sense of the word, you lack this or that. You have to tie into the superior matrix of your wholeness, which does exist and is now at inner levels. Your Christ wholeness, your wholeness of your I am presence, and your absolute divine union with your twin flame. You need to affirm it right here in the solar plexus, in the desire body. You need to have a sense of peace about present wholeness. When you have that peace, then and only then do you have something to offer anyone, any part of life. When you have the peace of wholeness, all you can do is attract from the four corners of the heavens more of that wholeness, more of the confirmation of what you know you are and what you are in reality. So while you have a sense of filling in the matrix, while you have a sense sooner or later you're going to eat, and feel that hunger. Presently you affirm, I am, I am filled, I am full of light. By that affirmation, by that divine beatitude, you will attract every person, every condition, every circumstance in your life that is necessary to the fruition of cosmic purpose. And that may or may not include your twin flame. But it no longer matters because you are your twin flame. I and my father are one. I and my mother are one. We are one here and now. That statement eliminates time and space, all distance and maya. It gives you peace and harmony. Because you know you are whole, you pull down from that causal body of light, your I am presence all of the virtues and factors and talents and supply and abundance and beauty and joy and wisdom, you need to be who you are. And when you are that one, 
People are magnetized to you because of their sense of need. You have in manifestation in your aura what they need. And so they come. They come to be fed. They come to hear. They come to be nourished. They come to you for advice professionally. They come because you have something they don't have. And you have that very simple key that all that I am, I am here and now. I am one. Alpha and Omega are one where I am. There is no distance between me and the white fire core of my twin flame. That is who everyone is seeking in life, the person who is whole and knows he is whole and uses his very wholeness to transmute the actual lacks in the physical plane, the last vestiges of karma and all of the various human consciousness situations that kind of get left over and still have to be dealt with in life. So that is the key to your union. And I think that that affirmation of being is the starting point of your happiness. If I see someone coming down the road who is having their head hang down, they're burdened because they're unhappy, they're not particularly well-dressed or clean or bright, this person coming down the road is complaining. This person is this, this person is that. If I see someone who is not happy, I'm not attracted to that person as an equal. I might be attracted to that person to help the person as someone who is in need and I am here to feed the sheep of the Lord Jesus. But a person that I'm attracted to as an equal whether it's a, a disciple, a chila, a master, anyone, anyone in life. I consider many people at many levels as having a co-equality, whether it's professionally or otherwise. I can have a co-equal relationship with that person. I can give and take and receive. And there's a purpose to it. That's the kind of person that your twin flame is looking for. A twin flame is not looking for someone to take care of. A twin flame is looking for your wholeness to complement his own or her own. So that when you are together as two wholes, you can minister to life in need, to lesser evolutions. So just remember, the mere absence of the quality of joy, of happiness, may be depriving you in the outer sense of more than you can ever dream of. So just at the moment when you slip into a little sadness, a little self-pity, a little, a little indulgence, indulgence in mood energy, at that moment, remember, you've lost the spark of contact with your twin flame. Your twin flame doesn't deserve to have to experience your moods, your self-pity, your self-indulgence. And if you can understand the twin flame as the God counterpart of you, and you have a sense of reverence for God in your life, you may look at yourself and say, I'm not worthy now, but one hour from now I'm going to be worthy. <laughs> I'm going to remake myself so that I'm irresistible to God, the angels, the masters. They're going to walk and talk with me. They're going to enjoy being in my house. And my twin flame is going to seek and find me. So let's all go to lunch. And while we're taking in, let's see what we have to offer. Take your notebooks along. Make some notes. Decide who you are. Decide what you've got to do. Ask God and then... Summon everybody that's a part of the mandala of your service and let's be up and doing. It's only in action that we find God and God in ourselves. God bless you. Won't you stand?
Beloved mighty I am presence from the heart of all life. Beloved Alpha and Omega, I call forth the twin flames out of the white fire core of being. For and on behalf of each and every living soul, I call to the magnet of the great central sun, O mighty action of the sacred fire, unite now the twin flames of these souls at the succeeding levels of consciousness. Draw them together in the level of the I am presence, the Christ self and the soul evolving. I call for a mighty clearing action now by the hosts of the Lord, the mighty I am presence, the seven mighty archangels of all that separates twin flames, all conditions of anxiety and incompleteness. I call for the mighty action of the sacred fire. Blaze the light through, blaze the light through, blaze the light through. I call for a mighty stripping action of the seraphim of God to strip now that which is unreal, that which is illusory, that prevents these souls from fulfilling their fiery destiny. O oh, love of God, immortal love, enfold them in thy ray. I call for the light of the balm of Gilead to descend. Seal them now, seal them now, seal them now. Let each one retain the remembrance of that inner vow of life. Let each one retain the remembrance now of oneness in divine harmony. And let these souls vow to give that harmony to life which they expect in return. In the name of our witness, in the name of Alpha and Omega, by the love of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother, Amen. I'd like you to sing as we leave. For the love of God to unfold your twin flame. It is a prayer you can offer daily in song and in love. In our new song books, it's number 175. It was a decree in the decree book 7.09a. We're calling for the love of God to enfold the twin flame, whoever, wherever he or she may be. And as you sing this, let the pronouns be your reference to your twin flame. You can say him or her as you wish. In the name of the light of God that never fails, I call for the mighty action of each one's own I am presence and Christ self and the threefold flame burning in our hearts. Go forth now and let there be an intense action of the mighty love ray of God around our own beloved twin flame for a quickening and activating of cosmic purpose for the support of that twin flame wherever he or she may be in life in evolution let there be an acceleration of consciousness let there be the mutual bearing of the burden as we give our life O oh god also for the bearing of the karma of our twin flame whether that twin flame is ascended or unascended we pour forth love now as the original vow, as the original vow of our union, as the commitment to our fiery destiny, and as the giving of the bouquet of all that we are that is holy, pure and virtuous in the service of life. In the name of Mother Mary and Saint Germain, Archangel Raphael and beloved Portia, we call for the cosmic cube to attend us and reinforce the divine geometry of our being. In the name of the living word we sing.
this mantra from the heart of St. Francis, the Ascended Master Kuthumi, may become your perpetual mantra of joy and blessing to your twin flame. God bless you.